Okay, so I think I'm going to make something that's going to make me really, really pretty. Ooh, what's what's it going to do? Yeah, it's going. I don't know, but it's going to make me pretty. I'm sure because they say <laughs> that some of these things are good for you, and I've seen it on the ingredient list. Yeah. Oh, so a formula here. I don't want to. Oh, good. You're putting more, on your. Protection. I don't have any formula written down, so. <laughs> Well, the good news is you're putting on your protective equipment. Yeah. That's a start. That's a thing here. Oh. I got this from my garden. It's aloe vera. Because they say it's good for you. Let's scrape some of this in here. Oh, good. Got that. That's aloe vera. Oh. A little bit of lavender we've got. Uh huh. And rosemary. Oh, where's the rosemary from? My garden. It's, it, they say it's good for your skin and your hair. And this is oh. a bud of something. <laughs> it came off of a undesirable <laughs> that's somewhere between a cross of French sorrel and Thistle. Oh. Here's some more. Got some little fennel seeds in here. Oh, yeah. A little bit of fennel seeds and rose oh, wow. petal. And capsicum, that's supposed to be good. Now that's going to pull. In the under eye area? Yeah. We'll put it Maybe everywhere. Hard? Just for the under eye. I'll put that. Oh my there. gosh. I got some more fennel. Got a different kind of rose petal here. More rose petals. Yeah, I'll just muddle these things up. Wow. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'll make something pretty. I've already got my coconut oil in here and I've got my aloe vera in here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, oh, this is castor oil. Hey, that's I a thought good it oil. was glycerin. I think I'll put some castor oil because surely it's good for something. Ooh, got pumpkin seeds. Got to muddle those up. And there's always alcohol in an ingredient list. I'm going to use a little bit of olive oil. Honey, now I want it to be vegan, so I'm not going to use honey. Wow, well, yeah, I wouldn't use that. Got some shea butter here. Mm. It's all of that together. Got this all muddled. Scoop it into here and mix it up with my other ingredients. My little whisk here if I need it. Yeah, yeah, those are great. I've got to have a mini whisk. Yeah. Ooh, doesn't this look good? Mm -hmm. Since I'm playing in formula, formulator. This is what I ended up with. Hmm. I wonder if I should. I maybe pass on it. Got to take my protective gear off there. I wonder if I should try this on my, my face. So, Valerie, is this a pass or a fail? Well, I think it's a, it's a pass. I, I didn't think you needed a preservative, I don't think, but. Um, I can't sell it though, can I? No, I, I don't think so. Do you remember everything you put in it? No. <laughs> yeah, I remember, yeah, no, you I, I remember every, everything. I need an assistant to write all of this stuff down as I'm formulating. I did I did write some of it, but you lost me after a bit. Okay, so I've got fennel blooms, 
little fennel flowers uh -huh. and rose petals and lavender and rosemary and two different kinds of rose petals. I didn't have any rose hips growing. You had uh, aloe vera spritz of aloe vera. And I put castor oil in. I was pretending it was glycerin, but it was castor oil. And then yeah. I've got isopropyl alcohol now. Is that what's in? It can be found in skincare, but not for the reasons you think. And olive oil. They say it's good for you. It it can be. It can be. Shea Should also, butter. you know. Oh, nice. Shea butter. Was the shea butter a pass or a fail? Shea butter is a great ingredient. Uh, it's really great. It's high in triterpenes, uh, which are very good for the skin. And molecularly, how will that work with other products? Well, um, it's actually good that you use castor oil instead of glycerin because <sighs> castor oil is oil soluble. And you had a bunch of, you know, you had shea butter in there, which is oil soluble. Um, you may have extracted some oily compounds out of the plants. Um, yeah, I'd probably say the alcohol may not be necessary in this format, but, um, if you had the glycerin, I'd probably recommend a preservative. If I had the glycerin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I was wanting to keep it vegan, so I didn't put honey in it. Yeah, that's good. Some vegans consider honey, um, animal you know, an animal byproduct. And there are some vegans that are, I call them vegan, uh, but they, they like bees and they like honey. And then there's a difference in this kind, this, this just came from the supermarket, well, uh, shelves. And then usually I buy local for here yeah. if I'm putting in my tea primarily yeah. or on burns or something, but uh, there's a um, Malaluca honey and that comes from New Zealand, I believe. Yes. Um, is there a difference? Australia, New Zealand. I think it's just a different, um, the bees are pollinating on a certain species of trees and that's the honey derived from that. Oh, Or okay. sometimes it can be referred to as the sap from the trees. Okay. Well, wow. thank you. That's good. Now I will introduce our guest. You've probably been wondering who is this expert that has all of this information and you know, I'm a lay person, amateur esthetician. I'm not an amateur no. esthetician, but formulator. <laughs> no, that's just, that's just not my gig. Yeah. I, I can't do that. So we have cosmetic chemist Valerie George with us. This is part two in a series that we did. And she is a cosmetic chemist. I mean, a legitimate cosmetic chemist and a science communicator, educator, leader, and avid proponent of transparency in the beauty industry. She re most recently worked on the latest research in hair color and hair care as executive price vice president at a leading salon professional brand. Today, she lends her expertise to others like she just did with me, uh, either formulating for large brands or teaching people how to make their own beauty products. She can teach you through her two companies, Simply Formulas and Simply Ingredients. She is also co-host of the award-winning podcast, The Beauty Brain. So here we've got welcome, Valerie George. Thanks for having me again for the second part. Yes. I am Jill Russell, host of Happy Skin Over 50, and all of my guests are not over 50, as you can well see. When I was reading your, your some of your many qualifications, I just kind of did a very brief um, description there of your um, biography. Mm -hmm. Hair color was in there. I think I had that on the last of my list, if I even had it at all, that I sent to you because you also, we're talking, I'm an esthetician, so I deal with skin and scalp. Yeah. Not hair products and hair color, but you also are a, a chemist for hair color and hair products. And there's one question that I want to get to that maybe you can answer that in, in the whole thing is the difference in dandruff shampoos, uh, because they are considered over the counter and not a cosmeceutical. Yeah. So, 
and hair color. And it was very interesting at the close of our show last week. And if y'all have not seen part one, you must go to part one, even if you're watching it after this one, because there's a lot of valuable information for you in it. But one of your mentors uh, helps you with hair color. So can you discuss hair products, hair color, and how... Yeah. It, how it relates to you or how you relate to that in the market, please. Yeah. So a lot of uh, chemists become cosmetic chemists for hair products, which is what I did. And I, I really like the hair. A lot of people think it's biologically dead, but uh, it's chemically alive. There's a lot of chemistry still of the hair, even if it's not living. And when you have a good hair day, you feel really good about yourself. You feel really confident and you can pretty much Feel like you can do anything in the world and so when you create hair products it's instantaneous uh your hair either looks good or it doesn't whereas with skin um you know skin is more about routine and maintenance and long-term payoff um so i uh, had the opportunity to learn hair color and so just because you can make a shampoo doesn't mean you can do color but you may be able to do a lotion or something like that right hair color is a very different chemistry so I had to apprentice under another gentleman who had over 30 years of hair color expertise to learn hair color. And uh, that's how I learned it. And I became a hair color formulator. And even though I was executive vice president of a brand, part of my stipulation was I had to remain in the lab. And so I still got to do uh, the hair color. Also helped, uh, there's not very many hair color chemists around. It's a very niche market, uh, but it also... Uh, helped that I was one of the only people that could do it, um, which is pretty cool. But as far as um, hair color goes, it's considered a cosmetic. You can get it over the counter. There's no drug facts box. Um, it would be considered a cosmetic product. In the United States, um, cosmetics are products that are, are intended to beautify the skin, alter the appearance of hair, cleanse yourself, that sort of thing. Uh, it can't alter or change the physiology or provide really any like true changes of the body. It has to be superficial. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned dandruff would be considered a drug product. Um, and that's because, um, even though, excuse me, dandruff shampoos. Um, and that's because yes, it's a shampoo. It's partially to, to cleanse. So it would be a cosmetic, but it helps, um, combat fungi on your scalp. And so that would be considered a drug. It's a treatment for your skin versus a beautifying or cleansing of your skin. So that would be a drug product. Similarly, sunscreens are drug products as well. They prevent sunburn, uh, which is a physiological change in your skin. And so they would be considered drug products, highly regulated. So if any of our viewers are wanting to get into uh, hair color and hair care products, you can help them formulate, right? Well, or, or, I don't help come up with a formula or what? <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I, I have two things. I have one, Simply Formulas. I work with existing brands to formulate products for oh, them okay, okay. and help them transfer it to their manufacturing facility. My specialty is hair products and hair color, uh, but I also do skincare. For people making their own products at home, I have a company called Simply Ingredients and I resell ingredients um, to estheticians, to people who have their own small brands uh, for them to formulate their own products. I do offer formulation advice, but I wouldn't in the space of, let's say, hair color because, um, you know, that I had to train. I have a chemistry degree. I still had to train for years to be a hair color chemist, right? It's not something that people are going to pick up at home. And furthermore, the ingredients are pretty, um, they're considered hazardous uh -huh. on their own, not when using the formula, but on their own. So you can't really get them on your own. You have to be like a, an established business to get them. So I wouldn't help anyone at home with hair color, but hair products, shampoo bars, conditioners, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I would help people. And you said shampoo bars. Are you talking like a bar of shampoo? Or are you talking about a facility, a salon that is called a shampoo? Cause there are shampoo oh, bars, yeah, like blow bar, bar, blow dry yeah, bar. No, um, no, like the actual shampoo bar. I have people all the time who say, Oh, I'm 
formulating a shampoo bar and I say, oh, this ingredient would be helpful or, oh, try reducing this ingredient if you're having that problem, that sort of thing. So the literal like bar of shampoo, yes. I also help people with liquid shampoos, conditioners, lotions, serums, face creams, all that kind of stuff. Yes. Let's talk about um, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, okay. and how they are in the beauty industry. Uh, right now, I'm just thinking hairspray and antiperspirant and deodorant. Those are over the counter. They're not a cosmeceutical, right? But there are, and then products that are sprayed that may have a volatile organic compound, the v a VOC in it, and what it yeah. does to the to the ether. You know what it does to the global yeah. warming or something. Yeah. So, um, volatile organic compounds, um, aren't just in cosmetics. They're actually in every industry. It's household products. It's the automotive industry, the shipping industry, everywhere you have a chemical and a product of some kind, there's a potential for volatile organic compounds to be present. And, um, every year in the state of California, at least, uh, the California air resources board takes a look at all the product categories and says, okay, in cosmetics, um, what percentage of VOCs are in the products? So I have to go through all of the entire product portfolio I'm selling, and I have to say, okay, do my shampoos have any volatile organic compounds in them? And the answer is yes, they probably do, but it's a super tiny percentage. But then you get to something like perfume, or hairsprays or nail polish, and those have lots of VOCs in them. Uh, and that's how the products work so well. So in the case of a hairspray or nail polish, you want to apply the product, but then you want it to dry. Um, so for, in the case of a hairspray, you just want it to hold your hairstyle. You don't want the hair to stay wet. So these VOCs um, are in the bottle to help solubilize the ingredients. It's sprayed onto the hair, then those VOCs disappear into the atmosphere and just the polymers in the hairspray are left on the hair. With nail polish, you have a liquid that you paint onto your finger, uh, but you want that paint to dry. So in order for it to dry, the wet part has to go away. And so those would be VOCs and what's left is the dry part. And uh, so they do go into the atmosphere they do get reacted by ultraviolet light from the sun. And some of these compounds are harmless. Uh, and then some of them they think may be contributing to air pollution, depleting the ozone layer, and overall just reducing air quality in, in our world. So uh, they have restrictions in the United States, mostly in California, on the levels of VOCs that are allowed to be in any kind of product. So every product has a category limit to it. So for example, uh, styling products, you can only have 6% VOCs. Um, you can't have more than that. Hairsprays, it used to be 80% a long time ago, back when hairsprays were awesome and really dry. And then they got lowered to 55%. Now they're going to be lowered to 50%. Dry shampoos had no limit before. Now they're going to get limited to 55%. So you can expect your... Um, dry shampoos to be a little wetter because they're not allowed to have as many molecules disappearing into the air. It's not going to be as dry. So, so a, mani a manicurist type, for example, take a manicurist then, um, they don't have to do anything. I mean, worry about emissions control or anything like that, right? I mean, it's not enough. No, it's not on the manicurist or the esthetician or the hairstylist. It's really on the brand uh, to make sure that the products are within VOC compliance. Oh, but what okay. a manicurist or an esthetician or a salon professional has to do is worry about the air quality in the room that they're working in. And many states have OSHA requirements um, to dictate how many air turns a room is supposed to have. So um, if you're working in an office, the air is supposed to turn over from the ventilation system a certain number of times per hour. A salon, a nail spa, a you know, skin spa may have higher requirements because there's chemicals that are present there that wouldn't be present in an office. So they would have more turns. And so if you're a worker in those environments, you're naturally being exposed to more chemicals, right? Because you're 
products or chemicals. So you're, you're working with these products and all chemicals may emit some things, right? It's just the nature of it. So, um, you know, just make sure that your employer is following the rules and giving you adequate ventilation. Um, you know, if you're a nail technician, a particle mask isn't going to help you. Um, it'll help you from acrylic powder and other powders that you're being exposed to, but yeah. it's not going to help you from fumes. VOCs, I mean, they're gases. You can't see them. A little surgical mask isn't going to help protect you from them. You would need like a true respirator, which is unrealistic to wear all the time. So, so this isn't going to work and this isn't going to work. No, that just shields you from physical stuff. Yeah, these VOCs are invisible. You can't see them. Um, they're literally gases and chemicals that go into the air and they need to be swept away somewhere, preferably through an air conditioning system or a ventilation system. There are some things that I've heard people um, talk about and as an oil, but I think it's got, a, they're in a carrier oil. So I'm just going to name a few of them. Um, neroli, which is orange blossom oil, yeah. and rose, rosemary, lavender, calendula. Mm -hmm. um, they, do they have an oil? No. Or yeah. So you're bringing up a great point. Um, so there's plant oils or nut oils, and then there's essential oils. And they're two very different compounds, although they may look the same on an ingredient list. So the oils you just listed would be considered essential oils because they are fragrant oils that come from the seeds or the flowers or the stems or the um, branches of the plant that they're being extracted from. They're oil soluble compounds, uh, but they have a fragrant component to it. They're very concentrated. Um, you would not want to put those directly on your skin because um, it may be sensitizing. You may get an allergic reaction. Um, these are very potently concentrated molecules. The oil that people think of in skincare would be a plant oil or a nut oil. And those would come from you know, the sesame seed. It would come from a grape seed, a cucumber seed, a... Um, Ah, trying trying to think of another uh there's well, so I put many pumpkin seeds an almond the, an olive cat the castor bean seed right so these would be plant or nut um or seed oils that um don't have a concentration of fragrance compounds to them they literally are made of triglycerides versus like fragrance compounds um and other lipids and so those you can put on your skin um, provided you don't have a sensitivity to nuts or, you know, whatever it came from. Um, and there's no sensitization that is likely to occur um, based on the, the fact that it's lipids and triglycerides present. And so what you would want to do is take the rosemary, the rose, the uh, calendula, and these other fragrant essential oils that you're extracting, and you want to dilute them in a carrier oil so that they're less concentrated and safer to be put on skin, but they're two different kinds of oils. Oh, okay. Now you, a couple of times, um, in this conversation, you've mentioned triglycerides. Now I know a little bit of, a little bit of Greek and I know Latin. So you've got the tri, so that that's three. Then we're going to glycerides. I'm thinking of glycerin and then ides is byproduct, right? Can you explain what triglycerides mean to our viewing audience, please? Yeah. So a triglyceride is basically a type of fat or a lipid that's found in plants and animals. And it's essential for, um, many different things in the body. Um, it's essential for building, um, cell walls. It's, um, essential for us to, um, be able to get free fatty acids, uh, within our body to do things. And so, Essentially a triglyceride is three fatty acids, which is a type of um, fatty molecule, and they're joined together um, by a glycerol. And so that would be a triglyceride. And so a glycerol um, it is a humectant type um, molecule, but it's it's connected to these three, three types of fatty acids. And so um, our body can break them down 
and the, the free fatty acids become free and then you have this glycerol molecule. And then you make you make it is a, a water. A water attracting molecule. A water attracting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a new term that actually I've never heard before until, I don't know, maybe a, a month ago or something that seems like, you know, there's always the next greatest thing and the most bling and um, Tasmanian pepperberry. Will mm. that help dark circles under the eyes? I'd never heard of it until, I don't know, six weeks ago or something like that. I've not heard of that. Um, if I recollect that um, that molecule is like um, something that increases circulation. And so maybe that has something to do with it in terms of increasing circulation to increase drainage from under the eye. Maybe that's a possibility, um, but that's, I, I don't think a widely used function. Uh, I've not heard of it in that way. Uh, but that being said, it doesn't mean an ingredient supplier of um, Tasmanian pepperberry can't come up with these studies to say, oh, I put it in an eye cream and it had these effects, right? Um, that doesn't mean it necessarily really works, but um, I've not heard of it for that. I would think that there would be ingredients that would be better for the under eye area. Um, when we talk about the under eye area, people usually want to decrease puffiness under the eyes. Um, so drainage is essential, getting drainage from the under eye area. And they also want to reduce the appearance of under eye circles. And so um, getting pooled blood out of the eye would be another um, must to break any pooled blood up and then get it away. Oh, okay. So like a, like a manual lymph drainage kind of thing. Yeah. But it's not really, it's not a lymph node, but it's just a, a gentle drainage or something like that yes. mm -hmm. would help. And then using products that will do that. Well, maybe with the Tasmanian pepper berries, because it has pepper in the word and it may not be a pepper and or capsicum, which increases yeah. the, the uh, capillaries, expands them, right? Yeah. Who knows? Well, then I don't know. My next question was going to be, and I think that we're about there anyway, are there any ingredients or combination of ingredients that will help with dark eye circles? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I would say the best ingredients for improving the appearance of under eye circles are peptides. I think they have a lot of research behind them. There's a lot of companies that, um, do, research into peptides for the under eye area. So it's not like one company is saying, oh, this peptide has all these benefits, but they're not reporting, you know, non-sexy data, right? A bunch of companies have peptides for the under eye area and have demonstrated um, some efficacy. And so I think in looking for an under eye cream for dark circles, I would look for some of those. Um, and they have different mechanisms. As I mentioned, some work to break up um, the blood molecules that are pooling so that they don't appear to be colored. Others help um, increase circulation and help uh, you know keep keep the system from draining. Um, it's you know why caffeine has um, a big appearance in under eye creams uh, because of its ability to to um, manage blood flow to that area. So. I would look for peptides and it'll usually be like acetyl hexapeptide, you know, seven or something like that, pomatoyl tripeptide five. Um, so I would definitely look for peptides because the peptides in an eye cream are either for the under eye circles and the brand will tell you that, or they're for the wrinkles under the skin or both, which would be a great, great thing to have. Now the peptides that there are many kinds of peptides. If can yeah. it be animal or plant? And um, peptide is being close to being really more of a treatment. So it's kind of close to an over the counter, right? Yeah, it's such a fine line because, you know, if you think of like the definition of a cosmetic, it's just supposed to beautify or alter the appearance of skin. It's not supposed to do anything from the inside, but then you have all these ingredient suppliers saying, well, it does stuff from the inside, right? So it's a really fine line to walk. 
Um, it's one that I get confused by all the time as a chemist. I often challenge things. Um, you know, when I first entered the industry, like, well, how can they say it does that and it not be a drug? And it's like, well, great question. Right. And, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, but typically the peptides that are used in cosmetics are synthetic. Uh, they're typically synthetic peptide sequences that the manufacturer has made. Uh, you don't find a lot of, um, animal based peptides you can, um, but I, I think it's less common. Uh, the most common ones are typically synthetic. So I would just look to see if the product is considered vegan or not, uh, because if the brand is using this peptide, they would, and they're claiming their products are vegan, they should be doing the diligence to make sure it is uh, synthetic, which would be hopefully vegan. Um, you can find some peptides that say like SH polypeptide 121 or something like that. SH means synthetic human. So it's a company that's made a human peptide, but it's synthetic. So it doesn't really come from humans. Um, so you, you would find that, but usually if it says like palmitoyl tripeptide or acetyl peptide or something like that, it's typically synthetic and typically vegan. There are some peptides uh, that I've used that to me smell like almost like sour milk, not sour cream, oh. but, but, but almost like, like milk. Yeah. It's hard to say because on their own, they shouldn't really at the levels you use them at, they're used at very low levels and they're very effective at low levels. So you don't use a lot of them. So I would imagine you're smelling something about something else about the product. Sometimes an emulsion can have like a, a sour type smell and it might be a skin conditioning agent that was used or a preservative. Sometimes preservatives have interesting smells. It could be the emulsifier. Sometimes emulsifiers have weird smells. So I would probably lean towards it being something else about the product than the peptide itself. Okay, because I'm not breaking it down and oh, here's a peptide I'm going to put on my face. Yeah, okay. Yeah. In in my area of the world, I'm in uh, rural East Texas, North. There are a lot of dairy farms and growing up here, I grew up here and then left, went to college, reared my family somewhere else and came back. But I always noticed that because daddy had a grocery store and the farmers and ranchers that would come into town on the Saturday that were dairy farmers, men primarily, some women too, um, but their skin always looked so good. And they did up into their 90s. And I thought, well, it's from working in that dairy barn with that. Maybe, I mean, maybe they're staying out of the sun because they're indoors in a barn versus out in the fields that might have something to do with it. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it would be. I mean, I know people say, oh, if you put goat milk on your face or kefir on your face, you'll get all the lactic acid, but uh, there's actually very little lactic acid in those milks, like less than a couple tenths of a percent. Yeah. So uh, that, that doesn't have a lot of ben benefit. You know, I would think that the proteins are providing more moisturization and that kind of stuff, but yeah, it's, it's tough to say, but maybe because they're indoors in a dairy barn versus out in the sun oh, all day. Maybe that's it then. Yeah. The, um, the difference in eye cream and then a, a moisturizer, a face cream, there is a difference, isn't there? Because there are people and I see them on YouTube and all over the place saying, oh, that's just a more expensive thing in a smaller jar. And it is not as it, it can just put your moisturizer on and it will do the same thing. It is that fallacy. Is that truth fiction? Yeah. Um, it, it's tough to say because, um, if you think about it from a skin hydration per perspective, sure. Applying a cream or lotion for, for the body or the face to your under eye area will provide some hydration. So if you're looking at it from that perspective, great. Um, eye creams may be formulated to have a different viscosity or occlusivity to skin because it is a sensitive area. So the cream may be more lightweight, um, not as heavy or occlusive. Um, so it's not weighing down skin, which, you know, I don't know if there's any science behind that, but it certainly is a consumer perception. 
the other thing is the eye cream will have um, actives specifically for the eye area. We talked about increasing, um, you know, blood flow, improving drainage, getting rid of the any dark spots that have pooled, um, improving the appearance of wrinkles in the under eye area. Those may be uh, specifically targeted actives for that. And then the other piece is an eye cream is formulated for the eye area. And so you're being very mindful of the ingredients that you're putting in to make sure that they're safe for use in the eye area. And the eye cream may have ophthalmologists testing with it to make sure that it's safe to put in the eye area, whereas a face cream wouldn't. And so from a, that perspective, I would say an eye cream is designed with toxicology and safety in mind for the eye area. The rest of the face is designed for the face. And so a toxicologist wouldn't be thinking of it for the eye area. And the viscosity, and um, that's the thickness of it. Yeah, the thickness and the texture and how easily or difficult it spreads. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, it seems to me like most body products to soften skin are called lotions. Yeah. And for the skin, the, I mean, the face, neck, decollete are called creams, even scalp called creams, not lotions. Is is that just a semantics, a difference in, in just let's use a different word for it or, or what is the difference in cream and lotion and why from body to face? From arm yeah, you know, my husband asked me this question a couple of weeks ago, so I think it's pretty valid. Um, I think it's marketing. And so I think as consumers, we have an expectation that a lotion is for um, arms, hands, feet, large areas of skin. And we have this um, negative perception that you wouldn't put just like a cheap lotion on your face, right? You would put a cream uh, that's designed for anti-aging and that kind of stuff. And when I think lotion, I even think like a bottle of Jergens uh, or a bottle of Aveeno that I would go to Walmart and get. So even me, a chemist who's formulating these products, I have a picture in my mind of what that looks like. And so uh, I think that's exactly why face products are named a little differently so that it further reinforces that this is for your face. This is for a targeted area. It's a more premium product. Uh, you're going to pay a little bit more money for a face cream. There's going to be actives present, whereas a lotion, I think, is purely um, a hydrating story. And, you know, you already think bigger bottles and, and that kind of stuff. So I think it's a marketing term um, to split those designations up. It's marketing to set up the consumer expectation of what the product is for and what it does, how big it should be and what you should be paying for it. So for people who are interested in making their own products and formulating their own products, uh, it's not limited to, to hair products, scalp, uh, face. If they body lotion too, you have, because you have classes and you have training, is that included in it or, or how? Yeah. How well, um, is right now training? I just sell the ingredients. I'm setting up, I'm trying to figure out how to do best, do some of the trainings. Um, because, um, it's really cool to be able to make your own stuff, but it's really head to toe stuff. And so a lotion, um, I would actually say, um, I don't know if you've seen, um, some of the body stones that are on the internet where they're literally like butters and oils and you rub the stone on your body. I won't name the brand. That's probably the easiest product you can make. And I actually have a kit for that, uh, because you melt all the oils and butters together you can choose the oils that you want based on the skin benefit that you want or how slippy or dry or greasy you want it to be. Um, but you melt them and then they cool into these little things and then you can use them. And then a step up would probably be lotions. Um, you know, you basically would heat your water with your ingredients. You would heat your oils together and then you combine them together and, and mix them. And once it cools, it creates a lotion. Um, pretty easy to do, but always think it helps to see someone do it for the first time. So I'm still working on the format, but yeah, that's what I, what I do. And, um, everything that I, I share with people are recipes that I have made and they're adequately preserved. Um, you know, I'm not using bizarre things, um, that may have toxicological, toxicological implications. You know, it's pretty, 
pretty standard stuff. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. And it's pretty, um, rewarding, obviously, you know, you can get some great products from the store. You can get some great products, you know, through your spa channels. Um, but it's, you know, it's also rewarding to make, you know, simple things for yourself, even if it's just a face serum. What would be the youngest, you know, age for someone to be start using products? Because I know there are several different companies and then there are the ones that are considered, I guess, green companies for infants and babies and children. So what would be an age for someone to start really trying to take care of their skin or to learning to take care of their skin? Obviously a two month old is not going to. Yeah. But well, I think it's um, skin from birth, I think has different needs all the way up until, you know, you're of a mature age. And I think what the needs are is what, what changes, right? So with, um, infants and, and kids, we need to be cognizant that they're smaller people. And so they probably need to be using products designed for them because of their size. And, um, you know, there's a lot of safe products out there that aren't designed for them, but I, I think using something that's designed for children is better. Um, you know, they're smaller. So when you put an ingredient on them that, um, okay, let me start over. Let's say I make a lotion and if I'm doing it right, I will have a toxicologist look at the formula and I will tell him this lotion is for the body. And he'll say, okay, well, if it's an adult using it, here's the maximum they would be using every day before it's not safe. And usually it's, it's a, a lot. I mean, you could put the whole bottle all over yourself and it's going to be safe. Right. But for a little kid, it's different because they're tiny. Right. So you may have to adjust the percentages that you're using in your formulation. So that's why I always say if it's a, a child, it's always best to use something formulated for them from a, a brand you can trust like a, a bigger company. They're doing the work. Um, the reason there's a lot of green products for that age demographic is I would say marketing um, because moms want what's best for their kids, right? It's ingrained in us, whether it's Jif peanut butter or body cream, right? And so when you play green, safe, clean, non-toxic, uh, that's all marketing words. I mean, the truth is it's illegal to sell unsafe products in the United States and it's your due diligence as a brand to make sure that it's safe. And so, um, you know, the green products are fine. I'm sure they're fine to use, but it's, it's a bit of marketing hype, right? Uh, with some basis behind it because kids are smaller in size. But I would say, uh, obviously, um, when you, as soon as you start cleaning yourself and cleaning the skin, you need to be mindful to restore the skin barrier. Um, you know, the truth is cleaning gets rid of dirt and germs, but it also may remove some lipids on the skin and even um, oxidized oils and stuff. So you, you want to be removing them, but then you need to replenish them. And so I would say some kind of barrier restoring lotion would be great for kids and probably all the way through your whole life, right? Whether you're um, a child or an adolescent or an adult or a mature person, um, you know, you need to be mindful of your skin's barrier. That'll be a lifelong thing, head to toe on your body as soon as you start using cleansing agents. In terms of the, the rest of skin, I mean, it's pretty low maintenance. Um, when you start to get acne and your body's changing and your hormones are changing, you'll want to start tailoring products for the face or the back or wherever else you're having issues. Um, and then that'll evolve in your twenties. You want to be mindful that your, um, your ability to produce collagen is decreasing. It's pretty depressing when you think of in your twenties, you're already aging, right? Um, but you are, and so then you wanna be more mindful of what you're doing. So I would say the moment you start using products to cleanse is when you wanna start um, moisturizing. That's like kind of the beginning of it. And so if that's a baby, it's a baby. If it's, you know, you don't bathe your kid until they're two, then they're two, right? But if you're cleansing, I would say you need to moisturize and that's the first skincare routine that I would have. You've given so much good information, especially for those who are interested in formulating their own products. 
Uh, but where would they begin now? You've got your your companies yeah. are Simply Formulas, Simply Ingredients, and the Beauty Brains. So mm -hmm. they would contact you. We're not getting ready to close yet, but I just wanted to bring that up right here during this part after we've talked about the the age and cleansing the skin and then moisturizing and replacing um, the um, or stabilizing the pH. We want pH balance. So simply formulas and simply ingredients. They, they would contact you through that or you have blogs or vlogs or yeah, so um, Simply Ingredients is a great place to contact me. I mean, I definitely recommend checking out the website, looking at some recipes um, and seeing what you would feel comfortable getting started in making. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, face oils are super easy to make because you're blending oils, but you're learning to, to feel different ingredients and see what impact they have on the skin. And then you can say, well, I'm ready for something a little more challenging, but um you know, the most important thing is to do some research and then just, just try making something um, and see what happens. Of course, um, you know, making sure that you're reading about each ingredient, understanding how it's used and the use limitations. Uh, but there's a lot of knowledge out there. I would say there's other really good resources that I'm happy to share with people if they contact me um, of, of some other people that are doing home crafting really well. Uh, you know, really sharp people who aren't cosmetic chemists, but they, you know, this is what they do. They just make their own products and they're, they're very good at it. So um, I'm happy to share those, but yeah, it's just learning and it's kind of like cooking, right? Um, you know, you just, you read recipes, you read, how do I sear this type of meat? How do I poach that type of egg? You know, you're just reading and learning and then doing and then making tweaks uh, based on where you live and the type of stove you have. It's the same thing with cosmetics. It's just scarier because you know, you, you're not as familiar with cosmetic ingredients as food, right? So, uh, but it can be done, but you kind of just have to jump into it. Then how does and one work? answer questions. Yeah, how does one work with you? Do you do it through uh, Zoom meetings? Do you, what would be, kind of walk me through if, Someone. Yeah. So if someone contacts me, which they do all the time and they say, yeah. I'm interested in making my own products, I give them a couple recipes that I think are easy starters for them. And, uh, I also give them some other online resources for them to read and learn from, um, through working different, working with different in ingredients, because my content is more, um, focused on, the history of the ingredients, the regulations, um, you know, where things come from, uh, how to sanitize your equipment. My content's focused there, but there's a lot of people focused on, oh, I tried to make this face oil and here's what happened. And it just offers a different perspective. So I provide a few outside resources and then, um, really it's, you just got to jump in and try it. So they'll order ingredients. They'll give me feedback on how the recipe worked for them. Cause I do provide recipes for people or formulas. And, um, it's kind of like that. Um, I'm hoping to get into classes next year so people can order a kit and then yeah. we'll, uh, you know, at your own time, you can do it with me online or, uh, it'd be cool trying to figure out how to do it in LA to do in-person classes, uh, because I think that would be really fun uh, to do as well. But it helps if you've seen someone do it uh, for the first time, and then you're like, yes. I can do this. So that's, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it can be. And not having to know about, um, I don't know, the compound chart and how molecules yeah. and things are working. Yeah. And that comes with experience a little bit. Okay. When somebody contacts you and say, I want, says, I want to uh, formulate my own products and I've got this idea and I really want to use these things, then I want it to do a certain thing like work on wrinkles or um, skin discoloration, but I want it to remain in a certain price range. You help uh, your clients, or what are they called? Your clients, students, 
Well, I would just say customers. Um, customers. Yeah. So you help with that too, when they say, you know, I want to sell this and it is a going to be a fifth of an ounce and it's $63, but then I want to sell this and it's going to be a fifth of an ounce and it's $422. You help them with, with that and understanding, or is it understanding the cost of the um, basic ingredients, the raw yeah, so I, I've helped some people with formula costs. So really it's, um, you know, I, I as a chemist at a company, I either use software or a spreadsheet, both work just as well in figuring out your cost per ounce of your formula. Um, once you get that down, you just plug in your ingredients in your new formula every single time. Um, but in terms of pricing for your business, um, you know, it's difficult because every brand has different operating costs, right? And so in general, the rule of thumb in the cosmetics industry is you want to have an 80% profit margin. And this will help you cover not only the cost of the product, but the cost of all the overhead that's not a product cost in, in selling it. It also leaves room for you to discount the product if you want to have like a 20% off sale or something like that. It still helps you cover, cover the cost of the product. Um, but like I said, every company is different. I've met companies that have to have, um, you know, a 100% plus profit margin, right? I mean, they just really need the product to be extremely profitable, um, to cover their operating costs. And then that tells me, okay, they probably have a lot of operating costs. Um, I also have people say, Hey, you know, this is really expensive. Can you help me with it? And then I'll say, well, you should be buying smarter, right? If your goal is to drive the unit cost per down and you're buying the same ingredient every single month to make your product, why don't you just buy it every three months? You can get a bigger size. The cost per ounce is way lower. And I've had people say, I never thought of that before. And so sometimes it's not even the formula, it's really the way in which you're conducting business or buying things um, that doesn't make sense and you could be a little smarter about it. So um, you may be spending a little more upfront, but your unit cost is lower and eventually you'll use all of that ingredient. So sometimes it's that stuff, right? Another person, they're making all these little tiny batches and then it's like, well, why don't you just make one bigger batch and here's the how you have to do it. Or another person was uh, using heat, uh, which was very limiting for them. And I said, why are you using heat? You don't have to use heat for these ingredients. So sometimes it's just looking at the process and, and thinking, you know, are you doing it the best way? Are you doing things you don't need to do? And are you buying in a smart buying pattern that can help drive the cost down? But yeah, I do help in those areas. So your spreadsheet will show the, the uh, cost of each ingredient that you're wanting to use and you you uh, key in your formula and then it comes out to the cost. Yeah, per pound or per ounce. You yeah, know, you can program it either way. And then you can say, oh, well, if it's $10 per ounce and my bottle is three ounces, it's costing me $30 per bottle in, in juice. Wow, that's a lot, right? So um, yeah, that's what the spreadsheet does. You don't have to have fancy. Some... Uh, places I've worked, you know, have software for that, but um, sometimes a good old fashioned spreadsheet is how it's done. Okay. Um, we've also got to consider things or well, I'm not going to formulate, but I know some people, some of my students are, and they're interested in that. The cost of uh, packaging, there are the bottles and the things that, that like the dropper things, uh, labels, sterilizing no sanitizing sterilizing the equipment weighing and that sort of thing you've got to take into consideration all of that as well right yeah it's your time it's how much equipment oh, yeah. you're using it's um in the case of a bigger production facility how many people need to work on the line to to do all the little things so yeah, you have to take into consideration what you think an hourly rate would be or if you're paying someone an hourly rate uh, you have to think, okay, well, what am I paying them? And then divide that out by the number of units. So yeah, it does get expensive. And 
you know, it's hard when you're first starting out because you can't necessarily afford to produce a bunch of product. Um, and so that makes the cost higher. That just is what it is because to, um, you actually don't have to sterilize equipment, but you sanitize it. So you were correct the first time you said it, oh, okay. um, but you know, to, to do all of that, it's the same amount of labor to set everything up and buy your labels and, and check all the incoming ingredients for quality. It's the same amount of input of labor, whether you're making 10 pieces or a thousand pieces. And so naturally 10 pieces will be more expensive because you had to do all this work for 10 pieces and it'll be less cheap if you had to do all that work for a thousand pieces, right? Cause you're producing more. So, um, it's tough, but you know, just know that as you grow, your margins will improve, um, as you produce more pieces. A lot no of people are making that. bath bombs. I hear that just all over. I see it all over the place. It's yeah. Social media platforms are making bath bombs. Yeah. So that's still the same domain type of thing, right? Domain. Yeah. It's, it's in the same neighborhood. Um, you know, it's, uh, the formula hasn't changed. It's a uh, citric acid and sodium bicarbonate. It's the same two things you would have put together in elementary school to make your uh, volcano explode yeah. with your science fair reaction. Um, yeah, it's the same type of thing, but it's the same concept. You put a formula together. Um, you know, I see in the forums, a lot of people have challenges with uh, bath bombs because they're trying to incorporate other ingredients and that sets the bath bomb off early, or maybe they're um, in too humid of an environment and the humidity from the air is attracted to the bath bomb. And so it'll start to degrade, uh, before the consumer gets it. So yeah. Uh, but there has been like a resurgence in bath bombs in the last 10 years, I'd say. Wrinkles and the way that, um, things are advertised, I guess, for lack of a better word. And that's basically what it is. Remove your wrinkles. This will remove your wrinkles but it's the appearance of wrinkles, right? In yeah. products, it's not going to really remove a wrinkle. Yeah. So that's for a couple of reasons. One, it loops back to the beginning of our conversation where we talked about um, the difference between a cosmetic and a drug, right? So if you are removing a wrinkle, that products become, that product becomes a drug. If you're reducing the appearance of wrinkles, the product remains a cosmetics. So a lot of it has to do with uh, semantics, regulation, that kind of stuff. It is possible to truly remove fine lines and really fine wrinkles because those are topical and surface. And so you can do a lot of that with adding humectants and hydrating ingredients that will plump up the skin. It's a temporary effect, of course. You can do exfoliation to remove the top layers of skin uh, to remove any surface level wrinkles, but true wrinkles come from deep down within the skin. And it's just not possible to remove those. Um, you can improve the appearance of, but really you'll never be able to totally remove the appearance of. It's really an improvement concept. So. Yeah, I would say that's why you see some of that language on there. This has been most informative, and I, I am sure that our viewers will find it informative. Yeah. And I'm, I've been given some of these questions to ask you, um, okay. and then some of them were questions that I had. But you can be reached at Simply Formulas, Simply Ingredients, or The Beauty Brains. Yeah. Right. Those are and good places to find me. So our guest has been Valerie George, a cosmetic chemist and a real cosmetic chemist. Not not like. Don't use that. <laughs> when we yeah. hang up, don't use that. Yeah, yeah. No, no. And since this is a, a series, this is part two in our series of two. And if you want to do more, I'm, I'm open to doing more because it's it's fascinating to me yeah so it could just... be fun if i sent you a kit and we actually made something together oh let's do something that something real yeah let's do that well we'll communicate on that now at the end of the show i asked the question to all of the guests and it's the same question i asked you last week i'm still going to ask you again and i don't care if your answer is the same i don't care if it's different i don't this remember what i said you, so it might be different <laughs> but it's been a week apart but 
Valerie George, who or what has been the inspiration to get you to where you are today and doing what you're doing in your career? Well, last week I said, uh, I think it was my mentors uh -huh. because I, I wouldn't know the things that I know without them and their guidance. Um, so I guess not, I mean, they're still my inspiration, uh, but I would also say, um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur now, I have my own businesses and I would have to say, um, it's the people that are supporting my businesses through um, either employing me for work on the Simply Formula side, or even just buying my ingredients through Simply Ingredients, because uh, without that, I wouldn't be able to do those things. And without um, people being interested in making their own products and interested in learning where ingredients came from, I wouldn't be able to um, have the site that I have today and fulfill my passion of sharing that with people. So I would say it's the people um, supporting my endeavors um, along the way as now I'm on my own. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, and we can't just say, oh, this is what I do and the world takes care of us. <laughs> you're, in a, you're a business. Yeah, and None it's really a, a group of people that are making it happen. So, and also I couldn't do without my husband. Uh, I call him Mr. Cosmetic Chemist. I'm on the beauty brains podcast, but he's uh, really my right hand. I literally couldn't do anything without him. So. Okay. So to our viewing audience, if you've liked this, please give it a thumbs up and I'm sure you did like it. So give this a thumbs up and um, subscribe, hit the subscribe button. It's free. There's a bell that you can hit for a notification that you will be alerted anytime a video is uploaded, uploaded on the YouTube channel. And um, just watch out for our next show where we're going to formulate something that's not something that me, an esthetician. Yeah, not that, not that. Or I, an esthetician, decided to come up with. Valerie, thank you. Thank you so much, Jill.